make a secret confession about Brighton? Go on then. I don't get Brighton. I don't like Brighton and I think it's tacky. And many people have said to me over the years, oh, you should go and live in Brighton, you like Brighton. And every time I go to Brighton, I think, what a shithole this is. Oh, how dare you? How very dare you? It's I'd rather live in Shoreham or Worthing or anywhere on the South Coast. I don't really get Brighton. It just is daggy. <laughs> Welcome to Own It, Your Business and Your Life, with Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. In this podcast, we're going to cover everything you need to embrace to become a successful entrepreneur, marketing money and much, much more. How to create a business doing just what you love. How to own it, your business and your life. This one will be fast, funny, feisty and very lively. So sit back and enjoy the show. Morning, Judith. Morning, Nicola. I've seen that picture before on the desktop. I know. It's uh, Namibia. Sue, Sue, Namibia. It's lovely. It's, it's, it's very orange. Yeah. Well, that's one of your corporate colours, orange, isn't it? Yeah, I, I love orange. It makes me feel zingy. So, yeah, it's quite an interesting one, that one. We're talking about momentum, of course, which is the first thing Judith sees when she arrives on the podcast. And uh, today is a Namibian picture. And it's an interesting one because it's got a thorn tree which may even be an acacia tree. Um, and it's it's interesting the way it's been taken because it's sort of overlooking a rolling desert and it sort of looks like it's a wall behind it, but it's not. It does. Yes, it does. I can see now the perspective, which is we're on the level with the tree looking over down onto that orangey desert, are we? Yeah, exactly. And the yeah. uh, yeah. wind's blowing and that's what's making the wave. It's very interesting. Hmm. So visual, visual delights. I've had some this week. What, what's your week been like? Well, I think my deal's back on. I think oh. I'm doing a private sale for the for for the sale of my flat um, with a cash buyer who's going to try and raise bridging finance on her mother and her grandmother's home within 14 days. Oh, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. And what I've noticed, which is quite fun. Go on. Yeah. What were, what were you going to say? I wasn't. I was just going to comment. You carry on. Oh, um, you know, I've cleared out a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, for instance, there's nothing in my kitchen cupboards. <laughs> and um, I'm loving living in an even more minimalist flat. It just feels so liberating not to have to fight my way. For instance, I don't drink tea. But I've got um, a pack of English tea bags for people who like English tea and a variety of vegetarian type teas for people because all of my clients when they eventually come around and cash flow games you know they all like different ones some people bring their own tea bags i don't drink tea so i throw them all out <laughs> and so i you know a little shelf in my kitchen which was very valuable because my kitchen is quite small now is not cluttered up with tea bags it's got the olive oil the um other oil that somebody gave me as a present last year the avocado oil i haven't used yet in a bottle of lemon squash and that's it and there's nothing I've got rid of everything it's just so lovely to I, I keep going and looking in the shed and the, and the cleaning cupboard and the kitchen cupboards and, and I'll just it's just liberating to be without stuff that's all I can tell you I think you know I think that's what we're talking about I mean I'm, I, I love this picture on the desktop because it's so minimalist it's, it's quite fair yeah. fair it's yeah. fair it's tidy it's clean let me show yes. you my, let me show you my actual desktop um, which is behind all these things, and you will see fair, tidy, and clean. I'm a very <laughs> and do you know what? Yeah, do you know why? Because um, I've had this. I, I used to date a photographer. Okay, so we used to talk about visuals, which is not my thing, but it was very much his. And he would remark that the pictures that I liked to have on my walls were spare, i.e., emotionally undemanding. And I have a theory that I like that, like that picture you're showing. Nicholas showing me a picture of clear sea on white sand and the sea is clear it's all clear isn't it? there's nothing there on top of it or in it or there's there's no features to it at all actually it's just clean and clear and, and i have a theory that, that for those of us who have and i certainly have historically emotionally 
tumultuous lives that the there's 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 sanctuary in pictures of fairness for us yeah it's an anti it's an antidote you know what I mean? it's like a relief isn't it yeah it is and it's, it's it's like a visual meditation yeah and it's not just about emotional um tumultuousness it's about when your brain goes 90 miles an hour and there's a million things in it yeah when you're busy yeah you just get yeah. a bit of relief from looking at a picture like this i don't yes you've got windows covering it up to be fair but yeah anyway um going back to where i was so um even though i don't know whether or not i'm making a sale and um this girl came around to see me on on saturday and she's very highly motivated she already has a flat in the building she knows both the uh the freeholder uh, and has had the same difficulties with him as i have so that's not a blocker she's the um contractor she contracted with the man that libeled me and knows him so he's not a problem She's highly motivated to move her grandmother and her mother into one of these two flats and move herself and her son back in so that all the four generations of her family are in one building. Nice. Um, she didn't even really bother to look around, quite frankly. She, she wants to own this flat. Her motivation is extremely high. Um, and she has offered me £10,000 more than the asking price and confirmed that in writing. I haven't heard since Monday, 48 hours, any progress she's made on raising the bridging finance. Obviously, if she can't, that, that that means we're all off again but my brother's coming i've taken delivery of some bubble wrap this morning my brother's coming on friday to collect the family heirlooms and mitzi's moving house on monday so i'm carrying on as if and there's even a faint suspicion in my mind that if if she doesn't come across by the end of june i'll just give the keys to the estate agents to go to france anyway well i think you're on a mission now aren't you you're on a path that's been set and the momentum is rolling and and whatever happens, you've you've your brain psychology switched into. I'm moving to France and then St Martin. <laughs> well, it kind of has, yeah. Uh, and something. actually, after this coming weekend, when we listen to all those interviews again, I'm sure I'll be more determined. Well, exactly. And you know, I've got something about something to tell you about what I did yesterday that's made me really think about it or not again. Right. Well, well it's, it's your turn. Tell me about your week. Oh, okay. Well, well, obviously, we can't go a weekend without mention a week without mentioning the Wildlife Festival, which was absolutely unbelievable. Uh, really good. I walked just shy of fifteen thousand steps in a day, Judith. And um, that was we went home early. We didn't even stay to see Disclosure because I, I saw the effect that Nelson had playing a Disclosure song had on me earlier on in the afternoon. And I thought, no, I'm not, I'm not willing to put myself through that. So um, Sarah was ready to go by then anyway. We'd had a lovely day. It was really nice. We spent the day with Irving and um, had sampled lots of different kinds of um, street food and, and listened to various music. <laughs> Sid Nelson play, which was a real pleasure. And uh and and that was great. So that was that was wildlife. And now we're on the countdown to Phoebe going off to Bali on Friday, and obviously the summit at the weekend. But so yesterday, you would have thought I wouldn't be able to take any time out of my week. But um, Manesh was coming to South Lodge Hotel in Horsham, near Horsham, uh, one of our favourite hotels on the south coast. And he was coming down from Mastermind on Monday. And some people who we know from the cruise and the Mastermind in Vegas were flying in. And interesting, one of, one of these one of these pairs, um, he actually flies jets. So he, when he wants to travel, he just rings up the jet company and says, "Got a jet you need moving?" <laughs> he flies it from place to place, which is quite astonishing, isn't it? That you wouldn't imagine that that would happen, but it does. So he and his wife get to fly in a private jet while he's driving it. And then the other couple had come from. Um, they live in Christchurch, but they and I, I knew them from the mastermind, but didn't know them very well. But they all stayed on because they were going to go to Brighton and stay last night. But they all stayed on for Elevenses because they heard I was coming, and that was nice. And so we all had a lovely time talking about everything, and it was not at all business orientated. It was just really, hang, you know, hanging out with people you like. And the couple from New Zealand, they run a pink limousine company. Judith, I thought you'd like that. <laughs> If you ever go to Christchurch, I can fix you up with a pink limousine. And they also have a company that's all based around numerology. And it's I think they're, you know, probably what top three in Google for the word numerology. And they have unbelievable amounts of traffic for that. And so we're sitting there chatting and, and um I can't remember, someone mentioned angels. And I said, Oh, my sister Sarah's just done doing a joint venture with an angel healer who's moved on to something else. But it's got a lot of assets, 16,000 people on her Facebook page and, and, you know, all these meditations and tarot and uh, no, sorry, not tarot cards, angel reading cards, angel healing cards. And Sarah's going to work with this girl to 
maximise her assets that she's got because she's not interested anymore. And this chap said to me, oh, um, our numerology lot are quite into angels. Give us a shout when it's all set up and you know what your earnings per click are and we'll, we'll do a little test mailing for you. And then I went off. I thought, that's nice. And I went off to take Minesh to the station. And he said, uh, do make sure you follow up on that offer about the angel things, won't you? And I said, yeah. He said, he's got a small list. It's perfectly formed, but they're very responsive. And, you know, talking about people's list size is almost as embarrassing as talking about other things. So, you know, in my world. And so I, I sort of waited a minute and I said, I hate to ask, but how big is his list? And he said, 800,000 people. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. I like numerology. Of course, I would because it's numbers and I'm an accountant. But I also like angels. I have Dory Virtual's angels app on my iPad. And yesterday, a client and I, who's quite woo-woo with tra and business like, she's woo-woo and business like, like me. She was trying to make a decision, and we debated it Arthur, Martha, back forth, back forth. And I said, what we really need here is a, is a, a spiritual divination tool. She said, oh, what well, angel cards? I said, well, get one out then. So we actually made a decision using an angel card yesterday afternoon. Well, it's just, it's a method of tapping into what you really feel, isn't it? Because well, quite. It was, it was the other alternative was to toss the coin, you know, and that one where if it comes down and you're disappointed, there's your answer. You know? Absolutely, yeah. But yeah, so, so you know, I came home and said to Sarah, come on, get your finger out because I've got a joint venture lined up for you. <laughs> Could, could completely change your life like that, couldn't it? Having a problem. Well, what I like, what I like about this story is it reminds me of the other story that you told me about the law of attraction, people that you know. Because and you had the woman in the Cayman Islands, didn't you? What, what, what I love being a woo woo is how popular these woo woo lists people are, you know. And you said when you discovered about the law of attraction list, you said, I don't know why you and I are in the business sector because these people, you know, they, you know the world is interested in, in numerology, angels, the law of attraction and whatever it is your Cayman Islands woman is into. Yeah, that was angels as well. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? So, um, so that, yeah, but it was nice. It was very nice. It was lovely. And then they asked me over. They, they went down to, they were, this is such a coincidence, Julie. They said, I said, where are you going to stay in Brighton then? They said, oh, um, someone called Claremont. I said, Claremont House? They said, yes. I said, are you? Are you sure? And they said, well, where? I said, where is it? They said, Second Street. I don't know, Second Avenue. I said, you're not going to believe this. I managed that hotel for two years back in the 80s. And that, wow. I mean, what a coincidence that is. I didn't even know you'd managed a hotel in the 80s. Yeah, I ended up getting engaged to the other co-manager and all sorts. It, it was when I moved from being a fashion designer into being um, back into the world of business. And it was my first <laughs> He wasn't the one with the Tom Selleck moustache, Nicola, was he? No, he wasn't. No, this he was. Um, he, had a tall he was the one who proposed at the top of Mount Tady in uh, Tenerife. I've never heard this story before. I didn't even know you did Tenerife. You've kept this quiet, love. You've forgotten all about it, haven't you? The eighties were a bit of a blur, to be fair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I, I I applied for a job. I was living in a freezing cold house by Brighton Station with a load of other waste, wasters. And um, and yeah, that's not true. They, one was a chef, and she worked very hard. In fact, we all worked very hard. I worked. I worked for a couple of gay friends in a restaurant, but I also um, was designing clothes for a local shop, a local designer shop. Anyway, none of us made any money. And what what we did make, we spent immediately on going out to the escape club in Brighton, and because it was you know new romantic time. I think it was a bit after that. Anyway, so um, I decided I oh there's and then there was that really fierce winter. Do you remember where where it snowed and it was about eight foot deep and it lasted for about a week over christmas it was anyway it's freezing and our house didn't have any central heating and i remember sitting wrapped in a duvet reading my family and other animals by gerald durrell and thinking yeah. i've got to make a go of my life because i want to go and live somewhere warm and not be trapped yeah. in a house with no central heating and ever again and then i applied for this job as an assistant manager of this hotel which was in home so it wasn't too far away but it was live in and I went to have a look at it and it had just been done up for the first time and it was absolutely beautiful, 12 bedrooms. And um, and I ended up moving in, running it, um, bringing all my family, friends and everyone to work in it and uh, and then getting engaged to the, the manager. With And then we probably moved to London. And that was how I moved to London and ended up meeting Irving because obviously the engagement did not last. No. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, I make a, can I make a secret confession about Brighton? Go on then. I don't get Brighton. I don't like Brighton, and I think it's tacky. And many people have said to me over the years, oh, you should go and live in Brighton. You like Brighton. And every time I go to Brighton, I think, what a shithole this is. Oh, how dare you? How very dare you? It's I'd rather live in Shoreham or Worthing or anywhere along the South Coast. I don't really get Brighton. It just is daggy. 
It's I, I, I hear what you're saying. It, it does have its seedy underbelly, but it also has an um, immense amount of culture, restaurants, fun, uh, music. You know, it's, it's a real, I mean, it's like a mini London from, from London, really. And I think, I think that's, why, that's why people say to me, you should go and live in London. I think they think I like it because it's like London. But every time I go there, I think, well, this, this place doesn't speak to me. No, no. It, it, if you're going to move out of London, you want to get away to somewhere that's not like London. Well, many people, I mean, I like London, you see, so I should like it. But, I, I mean, many people I like live in Brighton and love it. Well, you need to live a little bit along. The Shoreham would be perfect for you. Anyway, we're getting horribly diverted. <coughs> so, um, Here we are. so that was my week, really. But the thing I liked about that was that I went to do something that was fun with no expectation of a business outcome. And those people were just staying a little bit longer to you know, have, have elevenses for fun. And none of us knew anything would happen. But it really inspired me because they... They're all travelling. They tend to travel together sometimes because they all like fine wine and they go and stay in the Napa Valley and all that business. But they are so fiercely, they're, they're so financially independent, they can just do what they like. And, you know, it doesn't matter. I said, they, I said you can't stay at the Claremont. It's right. a lovely little place, but you need so, to. So. They didn't, money wasn't an object. They wanted to stay in the nicest hotel, not the cheapest hotel. Yeah. And they could just book at the last minute. Yeah. I if they couldn't get in a Hotel du Van, which is where I recommended and they absolutely loved it, they could go to the Grand. It wasn't a biggie. No. So three things. Yeah. One, one is you were out and about having a life. I was. Two, people like that, you need to remember that we're going to want to interview once every four to six weeks, somebody like that. So you should invite them to be on our podcast. Uh -huh. And the third one is... Uh, the Napa Valley, interestingly, what I love about the Napa Valley is lovely. It's not up itself about wine. It is obviously it's about wine, but it's not up itself in the way that France often is. Yeah. And it's really laid back. It's yeah. really laid back. It's a lovely, lovely, relaxed place to be and, and drink wine, but not in. I mean, you, you know me, I'm not really a drinker, but that's probably why I like Napa Valley. It's a lovely, laid back place, which also happens to be about wine. Not that they don't take it seriously. They do. Uh, the um, South Lodge that we were at had um, a MasterChef winner works there, and he worked there when he won the MasterChef a couple of years ago. And they had a talking wine. They had a bottle of um, Chateau Lafitte 45, 1945 on display. I thought, blimey, I'd have that locked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was lovely. It was really nice to go and hang out in beautiful surroundings and, and talk, not talk business, but end up you know doing a little business casually and, and um, just to be surrounded by luxury and people who travel the world in luxury. Very nice. So what's fueled your fire then? Well, I'll keep it short uh, after we were rather lengthy in that first section. Um, summit sales, specifically Alice saying when she bought hers, paying back to the podcast in general, which I love as you know so she bought it to say thank you for the podcast am i right in thinking that all the um people who've bought the recording so far have been clients of yours do you recognize all the names uh no 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 I, I, a lot of them but uh, well irene isn't really one of mine she's one of yours uh one of ours one of yours um uh, the first few were mine yes but then there are two that have come in via one of our affiliates oh. i don't know whether they bought via her link one of our affiliates is Amanda, who bought the VA thing from Carmen. Uh huh. And this a couple of times, and a couple of a couple of the recent purchases have been um, via that connection. Okay, so I need to pull a report off every day and make sure that I'm keeping a note of who who's due affiliate income. So, so specifically, what fueled my fire? was Alice saying and making a nice comment when she bought her copy of the summit recordings. Yes, that is very nice, isn't it? And just to let you know, I did send you a little picture yesterday. Our last episode has had over four to five hundred downloads over four days because one day was ninety downloads, one day was a hundred and something. One day was it was our first two hundred download day apart from that big spike in January, and then the, f the fourth day was also over ninety downloads. So. It's really getting some traction now. We're in the what's hot. We're in the top 90 of what's hot consistently on management and marketing in the UK. And we're slightly above James Schramko all the time, which is really making me chuckle when I see it on the Arts YouTube channel. Because 
yeah, obviously it's nice to be, you know, grouped with people that you admire. So that's that's fueling my fire. But, um, yeah, the other thing that's fueling my fire is Facebook Live. There's quite a lot of people getting into doing it very well now. Um, and, in fact, one of the people who I hung out with yesterday, Wendy, she's doing it um, on her travels. And she's not trying to do it for business. She's just trying to do it to humanise her brand because a numerology brand is quite um, – impersonal you know it's all about numerology and and they're trying to that you know she's just doing it because she's trying to inspire people to um you know follow their dreams and and end up traveling the world like they do and it's a very quirky little video she does they're very nice but there's lots of people now um sandra de Freitas, who i think is one of associate of yours did some work yes. yeah she's doing a good job she's doing it in um, in terms of marketing tips uh sarah newton who we know very well from the old um team help my teen tonight may get me out of here or something. And she's also got a, a daughter who writes books now at the age of 16 or 17. She's doing some nice um, Snapchatting stuff and also Facebook living. And um, the Merrymaker sisters who we've interviewed for the summit are on a road trip across America with Dan Norris. And they're doing quite a lot of um, Facebook live and Snapchat as well. It's, it's getting quite getting to the point where I have to get up in the morning and find out what everyone who I follow on Snapchat and Facebook live is doing before I can get out of bed. <laughs> And of course, they're all in the opposite side of the time zone, so you've, you've always got stuff to catch up on. It's quite good fun. So, yeah, that's, that's what's fueled my fire, as usual. About four or five podcasts ago, Judith and I came up with a brilliant idea. As is our way, we put it into action straight away. We want to create a virtual summit called Beyond the Laptop Lifestyle. We'll interview people who actually make lots of money and then have a great lifestyle and travel the world, or interesting people who have a great passion-driven lifestyle and who then make enough money on the side to fund that lifestyle. We're aiming for a real mix of real people, people we actually know, not going for the usual names, but a carefully chosen and hand-picked group of people who we know are doing unique work while living an enviable lifestyle and having fun. We will be making recordings and you will be able to get your hands on them as part of your upgraded summit experience. Just visit ownitthesummit.com. Okay. Quiet challenge of the week then. Well, it's yours. It's uh, <clears throat> it's budgets, marketing budgets specifically, and other business budgets. How to do it? How do people do it? How's it done? What's the best way to do it? Yeah, and, and I'll tell you what prompted this. It was someone um, applying, uh, filling in an application form for mentoring, and they said that um, you know quite a lot of the, the same stuff you hear is you know I've got something to share. I want to teach people. I want to help people. And I always insist on them telling me what their turnover is, because if, if they put zero in, I know that, you know, they're just starting up. If they put, you know, X amount in, I, you know, I know they're just sort of getting going. And if they put X amount in, I know they, they're more established. And he put in 98,000 as a turnover. And then I further down, I said, what's your marketing budget for this year? And again, that's, you know, that's a, um, a question that really gives me some insight into where they are with their business. And he said, um, pretty much zero. So I thought, oh, that's really interesting. So I went back and I said, um, I'm intrigued by by this because I know that you want to, you know, tell me a little more, bit more about your business and what you want to achieve because I say, see that you've got, you know, stuff you want to share and you want to help people. And you put that you're turning over 98,000, but you you haven't got a marketing budget. So, you know, tell me a bit more. And he came back and he said, well, the, the 98,000 is, is from my consultancy work and I don't need to market that because I get all of that through referrals. He's a project manager apparently. And um, he said, but the marketing budget is zero because I don't know, you know, obviously my new business, I don't know what I should spend as a marketing budget. So I thought you've been in business a long time and you've worked with lots of different businesses. So I thought it'd be interesting to come at it from, um, you know, what what normal businesses do. How do they allocate marketing budgets, if at all? Um, Do they spend the absolute minimum they can? Do they have a percentage thing? And then I thought we could talk a bit more about business budgeting and then and then the profit first book which does actually have the first book i've read that does actually have some recommended percentages okay so um somebody that you and i both know who's been self-employed for a reasonable amount of time 
once tried to tell me that there was a standard percentage that everyone should be investing in their marketing, which I'd never heard of before. All my accounting clients used to do something which you and I both do, and which in smaller businesses is um, subject to instant and overnight change, which is you have uh, a forecast and where you plug in your best estimates of what you're going to be earning and what you're going to be spending. And when earnings don't pan out the way you expect, you slash and burn down in your expenditure. And uh, I don't believe that there is a fixed percentage, but if I was that man you just described and I was making 98,000 and not necessarily spending it all and trying to build up a new business on the side, which is, I think, what you said, yeah. then I'd, I'd be deciding what of my excess from my 98,000 I was prepared to invest in my new business. So this lady yesterday that I was talking about where we made the decision about um, with using the um, angel card, she was looking at starting to invest slightly over £400 a month in something that was going to help her business grow. Not really marketing, but a similar thing. And uh, and it's a, a little bit like what you tell us about software as a system. It's not really software as a system, but she's got to pay it monthly or she doesn't have the benefit of it. Yeah. And I said, and what's the, what's the cancellation period? And she said, nothing. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, we've got to have it forever. And I said, so you can't stop, you can't ever stop it. You're stuck with this expenditure forever. She said, oh, no, I can stop it after a year. Okay. So we were £420 a month, and I went times 12. So you're looking at just over £5,000. And then that's a different thing than 400 a month in a way, because you've got to pay it whether or not it's working. And we had other criteria. She was frightened, but she knew somebody who'd done it. That person was frightened. Within three months, she decided it wouldn't be, she wouldn't be without it. And I think that, I mean, one of the conversations you were going to, and I are going to have off podcast is now that we've got this sales income, what, how much of it are we going to use to reinvest in the podcast and, and what will we do with it? And you know, because you talk to us often about your spreadsheets, and I know because I operate my spreadsheets, that you know, if income exceeds expectations, we might invest more. If income is disappointing, we've got to slash and burn on the expenditure to, to pay the overhead. So I think it's a movable feast. And I think every budgeting exercise is certainly in year one, you put a finger in the air, you know, with, whether you've licked, that, that tells you the wind direction and you do it like that. Now, if you then put in the actual figures that you spend, and you're in business for longer than a year, what happens is you get rather good at budgeting because you know approximately how it's going to go. You build up um, a better knowledge of your business, which means you can become a better forecaster and you can make better decisions. Now, if you and I were main board directors you know, for a bank or a business like that, the business would make a decision at board level about what percentage of you know, gross income or turnover or sales or profits we were going to reinvest in marketing. And we'd have to stick with that for as long as we've made that decision. And if business had a massive downturn because we came out of Europe or there was a bomb or something like that and the, the whole market lost confidence in our business, we'd have to have an emergency meeting to decide whether we were going to stop our marketing commitments or any other budget overnight and whether or not going back to my client who's going to contract for a year, whether or not we could get out of certain financial commitments. You know, so I don't think there's any kind of hard and fast rules about this at any level. I mean, there's been several things that have opened my eyes to looking at this differently because I've always been a bootstrap kind of girl. Um, marketing was always done on, on you know, it took, my, it took time rather than money from me. So my marketing was always blogging, social media interaction, et cetera, et cetera. Since I've discovered paid traffic, I've and, and also, you know, listening to Rich saying that if you haven't got a, a sustainable way of bringing new customers to your business, you haven't got a business. Um, and that's why I'm, you know, I was a bit, twi you know, we talked about this several times about clicks and leads being pretty much wholly a referral business at the moment, even though I do have a marketing budget. In fact, it's the most important outlay apart from my Infusionsoft. Because I notice that every time I stop doing remarketing particularly, so if anyone visits the site, they, they, they get followed around for a, a little while. Um, if, if anyone, if, if I, I would rather cut anything 
rather than that on my Infusionsoft, which is my email marketing um, tool. Then when I was driving across America with Mark Don and I, I spent quite a lot of time talking to Mark about how corporates look at this. And he, you know, we, we talked a lot about, you know, as I, I think I mentioned in a previous podcast and to you, we talked a lot about, you know, how he looks at things coming from a corporate background rather than how we all look at things coming from an entrepreneurial background. And he was saying that um, that it's it's the cost. And then and then I read the book Profit First, which we've mentioned on again previous podcasts. I can't. Judy, would you mind looking? I don't know if you can while we're, while you're listening, but um, yes, I think I can. Oh. You can find the episode where we talked about that because I can't actually find the book. Oh, no, I don't know which episode. I don't know. I'm not sure I put it in the in the show notes, which is the only way we know. Well, I'll, I'll dig it out afterwards and send it to you. Um, and and he talks about how. Um, how most business owners, uh, right, there's several, th- several things at play here. Most people think of marketing as an overhead. And what Mark Donnan and, both, and the, guy, the guy in Profit First said is that it's, it's a cost of doing business marketing because without marketing, you don't have a business. So what they do is, you know, you have your income and then you have your um, cost of making whatever, your, your widget, whatever it is, um, and then then you have your gross profit, and then after that you have your overheads, and then you have your net profit. Well, what Mark and the Profit First guy says is that the cost of making the widget goes in the, the top line, and so does the cost of marketing the widget, because without marketing, you're not going to sell any widget. So I, I definitely, I, I definitely, yeah, I agree with that. It's what we call, it's what accountants call above the line. Well, it, is, it is a cost of sale. It, it is well, a cost of sale. Yes, I agree with him about that. Yeah, so in your accounts... It's high up. It's not down in overheads. Yeah, exactly. And and I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't know this because they tend to put marketing as an overhead. And worse than that, they put it right at the bottom. And it depends on whether they've made any money after they've paid all their overheads. And that exactly was was brought home to me yesterday by that email, which is why I suggested we talk about this today. Because well, hang on, hang on before you go on. Unless they've made any money, they can't put it above the line because they'd have to borrow it to make that investment in their business. Well, they'd have to borrow it to make the, the cost of making the widget, wouldn't they? Do you think? Do you think the difference is that a lot of the time we're working with people who don't have to pay to make the widget? No, I don't think they'd have to borrow it to make the widget, because if you make a widget that costs a pound and your cost cost of sales of you know cost of making it at fifty p, you don't have to borrow it to make it. No, but but out of that profit that you immediately make from selling that widget, whatever it is. You should be allocating some of that profit to. No, I don't think there's no word as there's no word as should here. Okay. So, for instance, if, if what's left over after the fifth out of the fifty p pays you bills, uh, you know it, it, it's the same difference, Nicola. If you put it above the line, it means you make a loss. Yeah, but hang on, Judith. So, so let's just say the widgets. I mean, when we're talking about widget, we mean anything that we're selling. Right? It could be a digital book, ebook. It could be a painting. It could be anything. Right. So if you've got a 10, you're selling it for 10 pounds and you, it's cost you 50p to make it, let's just say, if, if you then say the rest of that money goes to pay my bills before I have a marketing budget, then you're putting the marketing budget right at the bottom of the overheads, aren't you? No, you're putting it somewhere in the overheads. You, and actually, t- t- ten, the example I was giving was a pound and 50p. Oh. Um, Ten pounds and fifty p is probably suggests that there's more play in the budgets. I, I mean, you know, you can only do this on a spreadsheet. Uh, uh, I'm, you're making your your point well, which is all of us might reconsider the importance that we put on marketing. Now, historically, like you, mine's an investment of time, and of course, time is money. And I was thinking about this overnight because I knew we were going to discuss this today. And I think that the probably the best year recently in my business was when I blogged every day. Yeah. I don't want to do that at the moment, but I, I don't rule it out. But I certainly, in my size and shape of business, would rather spend my time than my money on marketing. I'm not, you know, I, and I think the point is, it, you know, people who are, who are contacting you are going to have to spend money because clicks and leads is a money for a, a, a money spend form of marketing yeah okay so there's two kinds of businesses there's ones where the business owner is not looking to build a business that runs without them and they're involved in their business to the point where they, they don't mind investing their time which if they weren't investing their time for free in inverted commas they would have to pay someone else to to do marketing yes. for them yes and then you've got the business owner who wants to become 
um, free like the people that I hung out with yesterday who, who certainly don't do their own blogging to market their pink champagne, uh, not champagne, uh, pink limousine business in private. No, but they do Facebook Live to humanise their brand. Yes, but that, that's, yeah, that's, that's a sort of beside the thing because they're just doing it for fun, really. Um, so, so then you, so you've got to decide what kind of business you are. Are you a business that where you, you don't mind investing your time because you don't, you want marketing to be an overhead rather than an essential? Or do you want to have a business where you, you don't have to personally do things like blogging to market the business, in which case the marketing spend moves up above the line and um, becomes, you know, the cost of doing the widget, cost of marketing the widget, then that's your gross profit. And then the interesting thing about the Profit First book was that it says that what's left after those two things is, is what's called your real income. And you should be taking a percentage of that real income and moving it into um, other bank accounts before you then have overheads in the business. And I just, I've never come across this ever before. And it's, it had a profound impact on me. And it explains, apparently in the book, he, he talks about this a lot, it explains why so many business owners think they're making a profit but never seem to have any money. I think, well, first of all, the reason why people think they're making a profit never seem, well, people do make profit and never have any money. And I, and I can, it, that's got nothing to do with what you've just said. It's got to do with the difference in profitability and cash flow. And one week I will attempt to try and explain that on the podcast. It is a very difficult thing to understand. It basically means all the profit you've made is capital employed in your business. You're using it somewhere. Um, and it might be that you're holding stock or it might be that people haven't paid you yet or all sorts of things. Your balance sheet shows you where your profit, the capital that you made as profit is being used. I resist the word should very much. So when you say oh, what he yeah, says no, people should do is this. Yeah, it's discretionary, all of this, okay? And I think that if you put your cost of manufacture above the line, which is where it's got to go, because unless you've paid that, you won't make any, and you put your marketing budget above the line, because if you, unless you pay that, you won't sell any, then you put your overheads and then you put some of that in deposit accounts that he's talking about. There won't be enough money to go around for most businesses. So we've all, however big or small, got to make choices. Am I going to have some of that or some of that? Yeah. But don't you think it would make business owners think twice about going into business in the first place if they knew these things? If they knew that... No, 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 I don't. Because people go into business because they've got no choice. Well, yes, that's true nowadays, yeah. But why don't we get taught this stuff, Judith? You know, why... why well, We don't get taught... Why, why did we run the money gym? Because nobody taught us at school about maths. Yeah, it's true. It's true. They don't, they don't teach you anything at school that's useful on purpose because they want you to be a wage slave for the rest of your career, okay? Uh, what, what they do do is educate your brain so you can find out anything... So they, you can find out anything you are motivated to find out about. They teach you to learn. Um, they yes. They teach you... It's like, teach you to learn and the rest of it's up to you. Yeah. In the same way that Andy wants to teach people to think, but he doesn't want to teach them what to think. He wants them to Well, learn. I think, I think you know, we are fascinated by learning and we continue to do that. And this is a good thing because it keeps your brain active. And, you know, we're actively engaged in life and we find learning fascinating. Um, why don't they teach you, you know... <laughs> They don't teach you anything. They don't teach you how to get married, how to get divorced, how to change a plug. You know, why don't they teach you? It's quite passively and victimy. It's our job, really. You know, we can't drive a car until we learn how to do it. We can't. You know what I mean? There's all sorts of things in life which are choices, aren't they? What, most of my clients say to me things like, "You just tell me how to do it, and I'll do it." It's not really like that. It, it isn't. Nothing in life is like that, is it? No, I've been through that phase where I just said, tell me what to do and I'll do it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And unfortunately, I have to say, unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. But, you know, I would happily sit next to a person who was looking at a spreadsheet where they're forecasting their next 12 months. And if it's their first year, it's almost impossible. What are we going to budget for this? What are we going to budget for that? And you have to cut your coat according to your cloth. I'm not sure I approve certainly not for clients at my level, of borrowing to fund any of this because we don't know it's going to work yet. No, exactly. And you just end up more in, in, more in debt. And if you can't, it's, it's going to be really interesting for me going through, and after the, the summit this weekend, I will move this into project updates because I'm starting a software business and I'm self-funding it and, you know, I'm trying to do it on a, on a bootstrap. So I'll be 
uh, um, reporting on how I'm doing it and where the marketing is and you know all that stuff and whether I'm blogging and all that stuff. So it's gonna. I think you know that's that's gonna be really interesting because I'm doing it from scratch again. Tell us a little bit about Profit First. What have you learned from that book specifically? Well, that book is it. it <sighs> And I find myself in this situation with clicks and leads. I keep getting um, new clients and big, you know, sometimes clients come along and give me a big chunk of cash. But because other clients then don't pay on time, I'm although I'm profitable on paper and although I'm running my cash flow really carefully, if clients don't pay in time or they, they, they delay for, for whatever reason or they suddenly cancel and they don't stick to the notice period and things like that, it plays absolute havoc with your cash flow, and you the only way that you can be um, not in this position of having to monitor your money on a weekly basis and, and you know, being able to budget ahead because you can only budget ahead if you know there's going to be money there. <laughs> so exactly. so it's, quite, it's quite a challenge, um, running the cash flow and, and making budgets. But so, what Profit First talks about is this is why businesses do not. Um, have financial cushions. This is why owners who run um, profitable businesses never seem to draw enough money out themselves because they've got their spreadsheet in the wrong order. And he talks about how you you say, okay, so this is what's coming in and this is what I'm paying to make the widget and this is what I'm paying to market the widget. And then in a business, and he actually gives you guidelines. So if your business is turning over up to 100,000, if it's turning over up to 500,000, you know, what percentage the owner should then take of that money and what percentage the owner should put away for tax, you know, future taxes, and, and what percentage the owner should pay themselves as a salary. And then all of that comes out, and then you, you then cut your cloth, exactly the expression you use, you cut your cloth of your overheads from what's left rather than paying yourself out of what's left after all the overheads, because the overheads will always creep up and increase to fill whatever money's there. And it's just a... I don't think- I don't think this is unique to our type of business. I think this is what all businesses do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's what he says. Uh, and they have to be flexible. You know, they have to be responsive to sudden, unexpected downturns. I think it's easier to do it the other way up. If you have a sudden, unexpected upturn, it would be easier to say, of every, if for every pound I make over budget, I'm going to reinvest 50p of it into marketing. But, but do you see that that still means that one of the most essential things that, that dictates the success of your business is at the, at the mercy of your cash flow, of clients paying or not? I, I'm saying it is in all businesses. Because marketing is one of the first things they cut? If, in, in a no, no not, no, not marketing particularly. I think that all budgets have to be responsive to what's going on. So, quite a, you know, when, in the olden days when I used to produce monthly management accounts for businesses, the, the little management team would get together and decide, what does this mean? Does it mean we can hire somebody or do we have to fire somebody? Does it mean we can pay ourselves a dividend? Does it mean we can get that new thing we've been wanting? And you can't have all of those. You've got to make choices. And the thing that you do quite, you know, you're, you're, you're and I had to teach you not to do this all of the time, is that you are a, you, but if left to your own devices, you're a reinvestor. I am. You, you, you will happily take all the money you make and put it back in. And if you oh. do that, you never, you never have any gratification from all your efforts. Well, that is exactly the point of this book, Profit First. And that's exactly, I think, why it's had such a huge impact on me. Because it's made me realise that I have to take out, and, and only by building a financial cushion and taking out money enough money to live on rather than living on you know the, the minimum I can manage all the time because I want to reinvest in the business it's only by doing that that you create the right financial conditions for you to be able to, be able to make good budgeting decisions because you're not I think I think I think it's having a spreadsheet in year one and year two and year three and year four and beginning to notice patterns but I think you can't as you and I know because we use our forecasting tools at least once a week if not more often than that you know, yesterday when you sent me some money, I was able to go into my cash flow forecast and put it in there and see, you know, what impact that has across the next few months. Yeah. And then you can think ex expansive thoughts like, oh, I must have a conversation with Nicola after the podcast to find out how much of that we're going to reinvest. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, and circumstances change all the time. At the moment, we don't know how many sales we're going to make from our summit. Therefore, how, how could we budget? 
Yeah, and and all the stuff we've done so far has been our time, so it hasn't yeah. cost anything apart from the hundred dollars. No. Well, I, I take your point very much, which is that um, we mustn't say that time has no cost or value, because there's all sorts of things we could be doing with our time. Totally, lost, yeah. I've written down here, lost opportunity, because yeah, but I'm thinking more of people who. Um, you know, are a bit time poor. You and I have got plenty of time. Your children are grown up. I haven't got any. So we can decide what we spend our time on. And our job is to spend it on something that's the most productive in return for the amount of time you've got. And of course, it's more difficult. Tonight, I'm going to do a group call with people. They're all mothers and they're all short of time. So my job there is to help them work out which is the best, most profitable use of their time. And I think that um, if you love marketing in the way that we do, spending time doing it isn't a problem. But for a lot of people, they don't like marketing very much. They try and sort of ignore the whole thing, let alone have a project for it. Uh, um, would, I'm going back to one question you asked, you know, why don't we know this in advance and would it put people off? I think it might put people off, actually, yes. And then where are they? Yeah. So what you're saying is that the fact that they have to um, not only find a budget for the making of the widgets, they have to find a budget for the marketing of the widgets would put people off. Well, uh, everything, I think. If you knew what was involved in running a business, you perhaps might not yeah. end up so <laughs> Good job. Or, or anything for that matter. If you knew what was involved in getting married, you might not be so optimistic on your wedding day or anything. Yes, you know, it's, it's very true. If you knew, if you knew how difficult it was to park in London, you might not bother with your driving test. Do you know what I mean? There's just so many, and we can't look at life like that. I think you do learn as you go along, and you get more proficient, and that's the only way to learn most things. Yeah, yeah, by doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, and by having, pay, by having pain. So, for instance, a similar, very similar, is something we've debated on the podcast before where I said to, where, where they say, you know, We've made profits, but we haven't got any money to pay the PAYE or the or the rent. And I go, well, you need separate deposit accounts. And every week we transfer the VAT into the VAT deposit account. And uh, once a month, you put a third of your quarterly rent in there. And, you know, you know, some of this money isn't yours. Save it. People can't do that because that's how cash flow works. You know, it, it's very difficult. But that's one of the things you could do. And, and I think that the science of understanding this is one thing. The practicalities of doing it are quite another. Well, that's right, because you put all your money in your in your reserve accounts and you pay yourself first and all that business, and then some client doesn't pay. And in order to keep the business exactly. running, then you have to pull it all out from the, the accounts where it was sitting quite happily. Exactly, exactly. I also think you, get to, you have to get quite tough about um, who you're going to pay. So, for instance, in all my you know property portfolio, I'm working quite often for everybody else. So the tenant pays but the managing agent gets their chunk and the letting agent gets their chunk and the freeholder gets their chunk and, the, and there's almost nothing left for the landlord in fact I've written a letter to one of us this week saying look the housing trust has had their money the service charges have had their money you've had your money and I've got nothing left so this is the wrong way round we need to do something about it and so the only choice I've got to do there is not pay my bills but put a thousand in my deposit account instead because that's paying myself first yeah and by, not paying other, by not paying other people. Now, that sounds a bit tough, but actually, sometimes that's the decisions you have to make. Yes, and I really struggle with that. I always pay everyone else first. I mean, back to the money gym days, people who spend uh, without budgeting are paying Tesco first. You know, they're paying the, the garage at the car garage first. They're paying the car rental people first. They're paying everyone first before their family. And, and once you make that psychological shift, it really helps, doesn't it? Well, I think um, there's a good example, isn't there, which is we've kind of got to pay Tesco first, otherwise we're all going to starve. Um, if you're keeping a car on the road is vital, and it's less vital for me than it used to be, but there was a stage in my business where it was a vital, I had to put that first. Um, you know, they're, they're, it's a tricky old business, Nicola. It's not as cut and dried as reading it in a book and implementing it. But I do think that if you read it in a book, and try and implement it, at least understand it, and therefore understand the implications of the decisions you're making. Yeah, that would be that would be valuable. Yes, exactly. And I am doing that. I mean, you know, since I've I bought it, I swap my spreadsheets around, and I am every single time, even if I know that I'm probably going to have to pull it out again. Oh, I, exactly. It, it, borrow it back is what I would call it. You know yeah. what I mean? Reinvest. Yeah. 
but, but at least you're you're more aware of what you're reinvesting back into your business when you do that because you know the very act of moving it out of your personal savings account and reinvesting it back in your business makes you makes you feel that and it makes you make that decision again doesn't it well i do have a line that says that judith pays money in judith pays money out yeah. you know i do yeah. i do monitor both of those yeah, yeah. personal investment yeah Cool. Okay. Well, there you go. We didn't think we'd have much to say on that, on that topic, but we did. <laughs> and we did. No. Well, it, it, it's quite an interesting thing. I mean, actually, it's probably the perpetual challenge of running a business. Yeah, absolutely. It's good cash flow management. I mean, I, my bank manager, as he famously said, you know, I've seen plenty of profitable businesses go out of business for lack of cash flow management. Well, I don't think they understand the difference. And in a in a proper business, it's absolutely vital. I mean, we can struggle on for decades, but in a proper business, you could get into trouble quite quickly if you couldn't do that yeah good point so what's your word of the week then rain oh it has been raining this week i had was big rain um i had two several clients who went to festivals not just you and wildlife but there was the isle of Wight and castle donnington last weekend and they were up to their knees in mud they were mud fests (laughs) <laughs> um, I would know, you know, you know that lovely woman that was in the money gym at the same time as me, Anita, who lives up north. She was going to greet her children coming home from a mud fest with a hose. <laughs> um, you know, not my thing at all. Pitching your tent in the mud, you haven't a laugh. But anyway, we, what it's done is it's made my garden very green, very lush. I do love sitting indoors with the windows open and watching it and listening to it. It's, it's cleansing. Uh, it's what makes England uh, green and pleasant. Um, people moan about it. I was watching the tennis this week and, the, you know, the courts are slippy and Monday was rained off and da da da. You know, we do moan about it and it's easy to moan about it. But, um, you know, it, it, there's been a lot of rain this week, but not on my parade, Nicola. I've enjoyed it. Not on your parade? <laughs> I'm I tell you, the front, the front garden, you can barely, you, the man from Ocado last Saturday couldn't even find my front gate because the, gr- the growth in the front garden, you yeah. couldn't even see side gate from the road i'm like in a little hidden secret garden at the moment because of all the all the the, the plants the planting in the front garden has just gone gangbusters yeah i drove across to horsham which is across country and uh, it was so lush it was unbelievable i know i know it is lush lush is the very word what's your word of the week execution and not as in killing people a oh god for no. god although that is a terribly sad thing in orlando um, it is an, as in ideas are worthless unless you execute on them. Manesh and I were talking about this because um, a friend of ours has, has got things to do in his business and he's t- t- taking a long time to execute. And Manesh, Manesh actually had a new idea for something. and Within two days, it was up and running. And I'm, I'm like that as well. And we're not saying we're better or, you know, we're just saying we're different. And so the thing about fast execution for me is unless I get the momentum going, I, I lose interest. And the thing about Manesh was, you know, he's got a little team now. And he, he was actually saying he's created a system. So when he has a new idea, he, he communicates it to his team in, in a certain way. And they go off and they do, you know, the bits and pieces that are required to res- any research needed, any, um, uh, you know, any, any sort of uh, website page being built or everything. And he says it gives him so much satisfaction. He feels like he's leveraging the strength of his team to e- leverage his ideas. And that's all about the fast execution because, the lost opportunity, you know, it's like Sarah with the angels now. She's got this opportunity where I can fix her up with someone who's got an 800,000 strong mailing list. I mean, that could set her and this other girl up for life, you know, one mail out there. That would give them a big pot of cash so they could then make their budgets and plan their businesses properly. So, But it will, it will not be there forever. So, you know, now is the time to execute on that opportunity. Project updates. It's our last project update of the summit, Judith. Well, actually, more than that. By the time our audience hear this show, which is the 24th of June, the summit will be gone. Oh, God. Yes, it will. You're right. So uh, we are today. What are we today? Wednesday, the 15th. And the summit is the 18th and 19th this coming weekend. And on Friday, we've got this thunderclap going out. I'm so excited about that. So am I. 360,000 people. And you suddenly woke up and realised we'd only get a thousand and go to webinar. I mean, it'd be wonderful if we had even a couple of hundred. I don't know what you think we'll get from that, but you know, marvellous. But um, the sales income, seven hundred and fifty-nine pounds sixty. Little discussion you and I about how to use it. We can probably wait till next week after the event to do that. 
I've yeah. written here just down to the marketing, which is quite funny given that, that today's challenge of the week is about marketing. We've got a little budget there if we want to use it. But um, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yes, I am too. And um, everything is, is in place. I'm rendering the pictures to the audio so that we've got a, a, a one click play of, of the interviews. And, um, oh, well done. And, you know, it's a blooming good job I've got an old go to webinar thing, isn't it? I mean, you know. Yes. Because we would only have 100 spaces otherwise. That would be absolutely tragic. What was 100? Well, because most people who pay what I pay for go to webinar only have 100 places on. Oh, oh that well, is good. It's only because I've had it since 1998, 1999, when we lived in St. Michael's Road and I started NicolaCairncross.com and signed up for go to webinar and I've paid £65 ever, ever since, that we've got 1,000 seats. What do you have to pay these days on go to webinar to get 1,000? Uh, well, you can't. They don't do them. Oh. I don't think they do them at all. So, yeah, really interesting. And, and oh, well, that's good. Just another word on the tech. You know, as, as we, I don't know if it, our listeners know, but Webinar Jam did come back to us and say there was a technical glitch and they, you know, because stop, it was stopping mobile people looking at uh, um, pre-recorded stuff. And um, they fixed it now, but they fixed it too late. But... You know, we'd have been stuffed if, if we couldn't get a 1,000 people on this because, as you say, 360,000 people would get thunderclapped on Friday. Yes. I don't know whether they'll all be able – well, I don't know even – well, as I said in a message you saw yesterday, if even 1% of them wanted to come free over the weekend, that would be 3,500. So we couldn't even accommodate that. We, we can only take 1,000. So that's a third of 1%. But, but you know, that's quite a good statistic, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Not, what? So 0.3% we could fix. Yes. <laughs> Well, that's good. Yeah. That's good statistics, you know, because uh, it all works on direct marketing principles, doesn't it? That, you know, if you do something, only t between one and 10 percent are going to do anything. So if we're, you know, we've got capacity for 0.3 percent, then we might we might get a few hundred people on the call, which would be rather splendid. Well, more interesting than that, even, I think, for us is um, if we get some new podcast listeners from it. Oh, yes, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. Jump us up into the top 40 of what's hot, in which case we'll be above the fold and we'll get lots and lots of lovely subscribers. Yeah. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. I must say after the, what has it been? It's been eight or nine or ten weeks, hasn't it? Has it been, how long has it been since the, know. anyway, whatever. I am running out of marketing ideas. I don't know about you. Well, I'm just recycling. I'm just, I'm just promoting the, the the guests rather than anything else. Yeah, I think, I think it's getting to the point. I think the timing is perfect, which yeah. is, um, I'm glad we won't have to market it in, you know, for the live event after this weekend because no, I think, I think we've reached the point of saturating it. Yeah, and now we need to move on to something else. But in the meantime, then, and then you and I will set up a sales page for the recordings, and then we'll start to look at. Well, I am interested in that because yeah. I do think we've created something very valuable there. Yeah, good. And the other thing is, obviously, make sure we get some food in because we're going to be tied to the phone. <laughs> oh, I'm ready. Uh, we, it, uh, make no mistake, it's going to be taxing. You know, eight o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night, with you having to stick somebody on every hour and ten minutes. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be taxing. Somebody well, said, oh, I might pop up and have a pizza with you. I said, sorry, not on this weekend, you won't. I'm going to be with Nicola for 13 hours each day. <laughs> I've got to stand up desk ready so I can swap between sitting down and standing up. Because so that's a long time to sit down, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Well, we'll be able to run around because we'll be able to hear the people speaking. We'll be able to run around when you're not having to put the next one on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so who what's impressed this week? Oh, well, um, I've got a new app I'm excited about, which is called Duolingo. That I'm, You can use it to learn any language, but I'm using it to learn French. I'm on day 11, and my fluency in French has gone up from 5% to 32% in 11 days. Wow. Now, this is from 10 minutes a day, having fun. French, to be fair, I was good at French at school and I have used it a bit in my adult life. Um, but so that, that rapid increase, it doesn't surprise me. But um, it's 10 minutes a day. It's fun. You painlessly build it up. It's motivating because it shows you how well you're doing. It's free. You can, it, it, you can connect with your chums on social media. If you're one of those people who would do better if you could tell your mates how well you were doing, which I'm not, 
um, it uh, facilitates you doing that. It nags you when you get it wrong. So, you know, if you get it wrong once or twice in a row, it asks you a third time, it keeps asking you until you get it right. I'll tell you what's very interesting about this. How few words you need to know in a foreign language in order to be fluent? Would wow. you like to guess? Would you like to guess how many words that is? Uh, hundred. It's it's more than that actually. It's, it's well, I'll read you this: two hundred and fifty words constitute the essential core of a language. Wow. Those without which you cannot construct any sentence. I'm up to five hundred, and I'm I know a new more than that. They just haven't tested me on them yet. 750 words constitute those that are used every single day by every person who speaks the language. Uh, hang on a minute, I'm trying to scroll down, but somehow because you're, I'm looking at it on your, hang on. Yeah, here we go, scroll down. Two and a half thousand words constitute those that should enable you to express everything you could possibly want to say, albeit often by awkward circumlocutions. 5,000 words constitute an active vocabulary of native speakers without higher education. 10,000 words, active vocab, native speakers, higher education. 20,000 words, this is where we are in English, 20,000 words constitute what you need to recognize passively in order to read, understand, and enjoy a work of literature such as a novel by a notable author. So you can get by with 250 words in a foreign language. I think that's very encouraging. If people heard so do I. Think, oh, I can do that. And there's another thing as well, not just learning a language because I'm going to live in France and St. Martin, I want to use it, but it's really good brain training. Ah, oh, okay. So this is a free app called Duolingo. I mean, I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna bother with any other languages, but a couple of people have piled in and said, oh, I'm gonna learn Esperanto. Do you know what Esperanto is? Yeah, it's supposed to be the universal language of the world. Well, I don't know why anybody would bother with that, but quite frankly, <laughs> it's a sort of social experiment. Nobody's ever used it, but there you go. That's up to them, isn't it? Oh, well, they're bound to do Greek, aren't they? They're bound to do Greek, yes. I Have a go. I will, I will, because, um, yeah, because it would be really, I mean, completely useless for the rest of the world. But <laughs> well, quite, but, but nevertheless, you know, to be able to speak, speak a lingo wherever you go, even if you don't need it, as we don't yeah. mostly as English speakers, is, is fun. And Spanish is the one, isn't it, that everyone should learn, because that's the yeah, that's Spanish, thing Chinese. Of the Cantonese. Yeah. Spanish and Chinese, yeah. Yeah, Cantonese, yeah, brilliant. I don't think we're ever going to earn Chinese, quite frankly, because it's just too difficult. Uh, although I had a friend that learned Japanese, and my brother and sister-in-law, when they were in Japan, had a pretty good go at learning Japanese as well. Blimey. Oh, I know. So I've got an app too. Well, it's not an app really, it's a website. Sarah, um, a lady knocked on the door last Saturday morning, and I could hear Sarah being chatting away to her, and she came upstairs and she said, I've signed up for one of these things that delivers your food. And... Um, because we have this thing where we get to the end of the day and I like cooking, but I don't like shopping and she doesn't like doing anything. She don't want to do either of those, so. <laughs> but we both like to eat. So, um, so Sarah thought it would be really good. It, and in fact, Irving, my ex-husband and his girlfriend has, has the, have this as well now, where you get your food delivered for three or four nights. You can choose three, four or five, I think. And um, they deliver everything you need, fresh food, once a week. Is it, is it called Hello Fresh? It was called HelloFresh, the one she signed up for. But then yeah. we started, then I said to Irving, what, which one of you signed up? He said, Gusto. So we went so we had a look at that. And anyway, when we went to pick our meals on HelloFresh, there wasn't a lot that we both liked. So okay. then we looked at HelloFresh, uh, sorry, Gusto. And then we looked at um, something and coal, Abel and coal. Yeah. And what was it, Sarah, the other one? Abel and coal, she says, yeah. I thought Abel and Cole just did veg boxes. They do well, ingredients for suppers, do they? Well, they do ingredients for whole meals. Um, quite oh. vegetarian orientated that one, so we we just yeah. against that one. We went with Gusto in the end. But the thing that I liked about Abel and Cole was they give you all of them give you a fifty percent off your first week. You're yeah. not locked in for any maximum period, and Abel and Cole give you fifty percent off your fourth week, which I thought was a really interesting retention strategy. Yeah, that is an interesting yeah. strategy. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I've thoroughly enjoyed seeing how these three businesses who are offering very similar things market themselves. But really, what a genius business idea. Oh, well, if I was staying in London, I would be doing it with HelloFresh. One of my clients told me about it about a month ago, and we worked out that she was spending less than she was with her deliveries. Totally. I'm so yeah. sick that you would save money because you wouldn't have to go around the shop and buy a whole packet of something. You'll then no, exactly. They, they they deliver it like chefs do, which is in portion control. 
Yeah. Whereas, you know, if I've got a whole bag of carrots, I peel a whole bag of carrots. Yeah, exactly. Well, the portion controls can be very interesting because I looked at it and I said, Sarah, they look like starters, some of these meals. <laughs> she said, no, you'll be fine, really. So the portion controls can be interesting. The fact that I'm not having to go and buy five different packets of spice and herbs just to make one meal that will then sit in the back of the cupboard and I'll probably buy them again next time I want to make that meal. Yeah. So there is yeah. going to be quite a lot of this going on. But the best thing is at the end of the day when we stop work, we won't have that conversation of what do you fancy tonight? Oh, well, I'll cook it if you go and shop, you know, buy it. Yeah. And then we end up eating at nine o'clock because it then takes an hour to an hour and a half to make any any meal from fresh, pretty much. I also think that there's a, a sort of ready, steady cook element to this as well, isn't there? Which is you've got the raw ingredients and you make dinner out of it. Which yeah. It sounds like a funny thing in this day and age, but it's what we always used to do, of course, isn't it? Yeah, I think the other thing is we could, if we don't get on with it, we're, gonna, we're just going to get Jamie Oliver's um, Superfood cookbook and sit down once a week, plan our meals, and then shop for, shop for it on Tesco. Oh, which is what proper housewives do, darling, and always yeah. have. Well, we haven't got time to be proper housewives, have we? So there you go. Well, really, it's household management. That's what it is. Well, actually, I think you'd save time by doing that, planning once a week. Yeah, you would, yes. It's just having, the, the again, the discipline. This is what we're talking about. Having the discipline to sit down on Saturday morning, plan five or six meals and then buy the damn stuff to, to cook well that's that, that's why my groceries are delivered once a week because then yeah. there's always something in and and yeah. actually what's good with my acado delivery it tells me you know which days of the week the things are good until so when it arrives i look and go oh that means i've got to have my chicken on monday yeah okay <laughs> there's so many opportunities for businesses around anyway i just thought i was so impressed with the guy who thought of that one up that, that one i know i'm slightly worried about going to live in the middle of nowhere because you take for granted so much um one of my clients this week pointed me in the direction of a site where if you're a juicer and a nutri bullet person they'll just give you the bags of stuff already ready and all you've got to do is stick them in the and of course you're not going to get that in the middle of nowhere in france you're not going to get any of this in the middle of nowhere in france but yeah. london london and and the southeast we just take for granted what we can get delivered which is brilliant Send me a link to that that one because that sounds interesting. Sarah's just bought a Nutribullet kind of thing, I think. Oh, okay. So love to see that link. Thank you very much. Okay. That's brilliant. I'll see you on Saturday morning, eight o'clock. Woohoo! You certainly, you certainly will. Probably a bit. Could I make a plea that it's about a little bit earlier than eight yes. o'clock? Yes, I. Tend you know, to... I'll get I'll get stressed if okay. you're not there before. Yeah, we don't want that, do we? So. No, yeah. we don't. We certainly don't. No. Let's have a chat about the, all the other stuff after this. Speak to you soon. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. The podcast is called Own It, Your Business and Your Life. Do come and visit us at ownitthepodcast.com. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can find out more about Judith and visit her on her website at judithmorgan.com and you can find Nicola at nicolacairncross.com. Whether you are a raving fan of our podcast or a relative new listener, we'd love you to become one of our global ambassadors. This is a secret Facebook group where we have fun and make money by asking you to share the inspirational speaker recordings from our 2016 summit, Beyond the Laptop Lifestyle. Share with your friends both online and off. That way they get a whopping 20% discount. Help us to keep the podcast alive and thriving. Go to ownitthesummit.com forward slash affiliates to find out more.